today I want to talk about something. I want to talk about unbelief. Say unbelief. 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 This is what I want to talk about. And in talking about unbelief, I'm going to mesh together two different stories that do not go together. Okay? And I'm not trying to create some new theology. I'm not trying to do anything like that. I'm not smart enough for anything like that. But I do believe that these two uh, uh, stories in the Bible that they can help us to understand how God wants to help us with our unbelief. So what I want us to do now is we're going to look at a verse from the parable of the sower of the seed in Matthew. And in that, the seed, it represents the word of God. This, that parable, the seed represents the word of God. And the soil represents four different conditions of the human heart. And what we're going to look at, we're not going to look at all of them. We're just going to look at the third one, I think it is. And it's the heart that, that had, uh, had the thorns and the weeds that were in it. And so we're going to look at that. It's found in Matthew 13, verse 22, and it says this. The seed that fell among the thorns, it fell on the heart of thorns, that represents those who hear God's word, but they're all too quickly, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. I want to read that one more time. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly, that message, that seed, it's crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth. And what happens? What's the result of that? No fruit is produced in that person's heart, in that person's life. <clears throat> Jenny and I, we have a garden. I'm going to throw a photo up here on that. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Oh, okay, it's up over there. This is our garden. It, obviously, it's not that right now. That's our house. Uh, I have some uh, wood there. I, I, I fenced in our garden so the animals can't get into it. And this here is wildflowers on the back side. We planted wildflowers there. So, because if you saw our garden, you'd be thinking, that's a garden? No way is that a garden. Because... We do have issues with e weeds out where we are. I, everyone has issues with weeds, but for some reason, I don't know. My wife, she's the one who's the weeder. She's the one that goes in there all the time. I'm the one who sneaks off pretending like I'm weeding, but I'm not. But the weeds, they grow. They grow in this place. Matter of fact, uh, we plant. We plant, matter of fact, we plant uh, special kinds of green beans because we like green beans. And so we'll make these rows and we'll plant them a couple weeks apart so that we have a continual harvest of what we want. But in doing so, it's like, which do I pluck, Jenny? I don't know where the green beans are because the weeds are so full there. They're so high. And sometimes when we planted that one seed, there were other seeds that were planted inside that garden as well. Weed seeds. Is, is there such a thing? <laughs> lots and lots of weed seeds, all different sorts of things. And what they do, they grow up with it. And they grow up, sometimes they grow up way taller than what we actually planted and they overshadow it. And they're constantly in competition with our seeds that we planted. They're in competition for the soil, the nutrients in the soil. The seeds that are already there that we didn't plant, they're, they're in competition for the water for the seeds that we planted. They're in competition if they get so high for the sunlight for our plants. And so what happens, it kind of crowds out those things. And so we have to go, if we want to harvest, listen to this, if we want green beans, she has to go out there and pull those weeds. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh. But they're always competing for those things. The Word of God is the same way. When, God, when we hear the Word of God and we read the Word of God and we accept it into our hearts and it's planted in there, the devil loves to come in and plant other seeds as well. And sometimes we plant seeds ourselves by our own stupidity sometimes. And those seeds that are in our lives... They kind of grow up and they kind of choke out what God's doing or what God wants to do in our lives. And the result, we don't have the lifestyle that God wants for every one of his children. A lifestyle of victory, right? A lifestyle of an overcomer. That's what God wants for us. Why is that? Because there's certain things uh, within a believer's heart sometimes that we allow and if we don't weed it, if we don't take care of it, it will come in, it will compete with the word of God. It will compete with the seed of God. It doesn't destroy the seed of God. It's perfect. It will always accomplish what it wants to do. But the weeds can come in and they can choke it out so that there is no fruit in our lives. We don't look like the Christians we read in the Bible. We don't act like the Christians. We don't have the victory like they have in the Bible. We're different. And lots of times it has to do with those weeds that's in our heart that's choking out what God wants to do through his word in our life. Uh, 
Hallelujah. They're all vying for that space. Uh, the, again, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life. Other, other versions of the Bible say this. The message is crowded out by the worries of this life or by the, the cares of this world or by the, I like this one, the distractions of the world. And also the lure of wealth. And what's the result of that when these seeds grow up around the seed and they're not dealt with right away? They're not weeded out. They will choke out what God wants to do in our lives and we won't produce the fruit that God has for us. Amen? All seeds compete with the word of God. Let's look at another. Now this is another Bible story and I'm going to kind of mesh them together and we'll get a story out of it. We'll get a, a, a lesson I believe God wants to teach us today. This is Jesus and his disciples. Um, Jesus took three of his disciples up to the Mount of Transfiguration. As he went up there, he's with, the, uh, uh, with God and God revealed himself. And, and, uh, and down at the bottom of the mountain remained the other disciples. How many would that be? Nine. Nine other disciples. They were down there. And as they was down there, something happened. And so when Jesus and the three disciples are done, they come walking down the mountain. Jesus sees what's going on. And here's what happens. We're looking at Mark 9, verse 14 through 20. And when Jesus and his disciples returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them. And some of the teachers of the religious law were arguing with them. Oh. And when the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe and they ran to greet him. What is all this arguing about? Jesus asked. And one of the men in the crowd, he spoke up and he says, Teacher, just picture someone who's really desperate. Teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. And Jesus said to them, you faithless people. Now that word there, faithless, if you look in the Bible and if you look at the Greek, and matter of fact, your Bible might have a different word there. It might say you unbelieving people. And I think that's a much better fit for this. You unbelieving people. Who's he talking to? He's talking to his disciples, I believe. You unbelieving people. You unbelieving people. Um, by the way, unbelief is not an absence of faith. You can have unbelief and you can have faith as well. You hear what I'm saying? You can... Unbelief is not an absence of faith. You can have faith, but unbelief is just means there's a presence of unbelief. And how we know this? We'll, we'll look at the scripture later on. This, listen to what the Father said later on. But the, the problem is this. Um, later, on, later on, actually, the, the, the man says this. Lord, I believe. See, he had faith. He says, Lord, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. Help me, God. How many of you guys have ever felt that way? Yeah, I believe in you, God. I worship you, God. I sing to you, God. I read your word. I, I obey your word in every way I can. But sometimes there's this thing that rises up within me and I just feel, ah, will God come through on this? Will God be faithful in this? And there's that weed of unbelief that just kind of pokes out of the ground and starts to take over and wants to choke out that weed. It wants to choke out the seed of faith that God has planted through his word. The problem is we have more than one kind of seed growing in our garden. It's not a faithless garden. It's a garden that has that seed in it. Inside of every one of us, there's that seed that God has still planted, but there's other things that are planted in there as well, and unbelief is one of those things. An example, there's a man, uh, people who say, you know, I could believe lots of the Bible, but there are parts of the Bible I just, I have intellectual uh, uh, problem with. Well, they don't have an intellectual problem. They have an unbelief problem. <laughs> Amen? They can believe part of it, but they can't believe all of God's word. They've got a problem. It's unbelief. But the problem is this. They're thinking and believing the wrong things. And so the seeds, that seed there will compete, that seed of unbelief, that seed of intellectualism will compete with what God wants to do in our lives. And it will choke it out because we will we'll let that thing grow and they'll cover it up and they'll starve out that seed. Let's continue on. I'm going to read that part again. Jesus said to them, you unbelieving people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. Can you imagine the disciples when they saw this? 
You know, they, they saw this guy, this young boy, just all of a sudden writhing. Just, I mean, it just took him down. Today, we would call uh, some of this stuff, and it sounds very much like an epileptic seizure, if I said that correctly. I, I know I didn't pronounce it correctly, but like an epileptic seizure. It just causes them to go rigid. It just causes them. But this one is also unique in the fact that the boy could never speak. And we're going to find out also that this, this particular spirit did everything in its power to try and kill this boy as well. There's a quote. Um, but again, if, if you imagine the disciples, they looked and they saw that. What do you think came over them? Fear, doubt, unbelief. Ah, you know, wow, no wonder we couldn't do it. This thing is way bigger than I am. Ooh, there's a weed right there. Uh, this, this thing is too powerful for even... We used to cast out demons before Jesus told us to, but now we can't. Ah, this, this thing is even greater than we can even imagine. Or we're do, you, know, you can just imagine all the things that went on to the, in the disciples. But it just, they saw this, listen to me, they saw this, and when they saw it, something came in them that they couldn't cast this thing out. Fear, doubt, and unbelief. There's a quote by a man, by, a pastor by the name of Bill Johnson, that says this, If the devil can create enough disturbance with what you see in the natural, it will interfere with what you can see in the spiritual. See, we're spiritual people. When God tells us to believe what he says, then we, we're seeing in the spiritual realm. God says, I will do this for you. I promise this for you. If you obey in this area, this thing will happen in your life. And we, we pray for things. We pray for healing. We pray for deliverance. We pray for God to give wisdom. We pray for all these things. And that comes from the spiritual realm. But when our eyes are focused on the things that's happening here in the physical realm, the devil will do everything he can to throw out anything to just grab our attention and distract us to the point that we are no longer looking to God. We're no longer looking in the spiritual realm. No longer receiving what God wants us to pull down in the spiritual realm. Instead, we're focused on this thing that's right in front of us. And I think that's one of the reasons why this devil presented himself at that time. Obviously, he's in the presence of God Almighty, Jesus. But also, he wants to cause people to freeze up. He wants to choke out what God's called them to be and called them to do. God gives us promises, but unbelief can take root when we're distracted with the problems of our life. Faith, now listen to this. Faith does not deny a problem's existence. It never has. When people say, oh, everything's fine, I'm fine, you know. Well, obviously, your leg is broken. It's, it's in three different pieces there. What, no, I'm fine, praise the Lord, hallelujah, just get me to my home, you know, whatever it may be. I mean, faith does not do that. That's stupidity, amen? <laughs> faith doesn't deny a problem's existence. Faith denies a problem's place of influence in our life. Say, I'm not going to allow you to influence my life. I see it. Yes, I, I don't doubt it. That's, there it is. But my faith is in God, and I'm not going to allow you to influence what God wants to do in my life. My focus is on Him, and it's not going to remain on you any longer. Amen? Hallelujah. Mark 9, verses 20 through 29. So they brought the boy, and when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion, and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy. The spirit often throws him into the fire or into the water, trying to kill him. Lord, have mercy on us. Help us if you can. What do you mean if I can, Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. Amen. You know, this man, I mean, this is about the smallest amount of faith a person can have. He had faith because he still brought the boy to Jesus Christ, did he not? He had a little bit of faith, but he had all these other weeds in his heart that was so choking it out. All this time that he had spent raising this child, all the, the money he spent on doctors, all the times he even took the child to the disciples and they couldn't deliver the boy. Yet he still had that little bit of faith. But the weeds were choking everything out and it got to the point he says, heal him if you can, God. And God says, if I can, I will. He didn't say that, did he? Actually, he, actually, if you look at it, he actually turned it around. He says, if you only believe, I can. If you look at different parts of the scripture, it says, if you believe, I can. So, so I've got, so the father cried out. I, uh, let me see if I missed it here. What do you mean if I can, Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe. I do believe. But help me overcome my unbelief. He was being realistic about that, wasn't he? I've got, what he's saying is, Lord, I believe, but I got more than one plant in my heart right now growing, choking that out. I need help with those weeds. I need help with those things that's choking it out. Lord, I need you. I need you. And when Jesus saw the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, 
Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak, he said. I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. I love that. Authority. Then the spirit screamed and he threw the boy into another violent convulsion and then he left him. The boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd as the people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet and he stood up. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that devil? Why couldn't we cast out that spirit? Wouldn't you guys ask that question also? Well, why couldn't we do that? And Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out only by prayer and fasting. Again, we find all kinds of things planted in the garden of our heart. We have that faith, that seed of faith, the word of God, and we believe it. It's there. It's mighty. It's powerful. It's ready to produce what God wants it to produce in our lives. But there's also many, many other seeds that are out there doing its very best to choke it out, to distract us, to take our eyes off of God, and to put it, and allow it to overshadow so that we'll, we'll never produce the fruit that God wants to do in our lives. That's what the devil wants to do. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy your life. And he'll do everything in his power to do that, and every trickery. Um, if you have God's word in your life, you have faith. And, but to be honest, some of us have unbelief in our life as well, don't we? Be honest. We do. I want to deal with that. And God wants us to deal with that today. He wants us to trust him. He wants to see us overcomers. I used to think that in order to be an overcomer, I needed bigger faith. How many of you guys ever think that? I needed bigger faith. I needed greater faith. I need more faith. Give me more faith, God. More, more, more. But Jesus kind of dealt with that. Jesus said, you don't need bigger faith. All you need is the faith of a mustard seed. Did he not say that? He said, that's all you need. That seed that's there, it's planted. It's powerful. It's ready to produce what I called it to produce in your life. What we got to do now is deal with the weeds that's all around it, those things of unbelief, those things of doubt, those things of fear, those things of past failures in our life that we judge everything by. We need to deal with those weeds and pull them out so that that seed could sprout, so that seed could take root and it could produce the fruit in your life that I so want in your life. God so wants that in our life. The problem is we have all kinds of other plants that are crowding out God's seed in our life. Jesus' disciples, think about them. They were the most skilled and trained people to drive out demons ever. At one time, Jesus says, hey, I want you guys, I want you to go two by two to all these cities I'm getting ready to visit. You 12 disciples, go, and I give you authority over all demons and over all evil spirits, and you have to cast them out, and you have to, uh, to pray for those who are sick, and now go. And he sent them out two by two. And they came back victorious because they were able to do everything that God had sent them to do. And it was so great that later on in the uh, uh, last part of book, book of Luke, I think it is, uh, God, uh, Jesus sent them out again, but he added 70 more disciples with him. He says, hey, you 70, join them. So now we have uh, 82 disciples running out there and he gave them power and they went to all these different cities ahead of God and they were cleaning them out, cleaning them out of all these demons and they were saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is coming. And when they came back and they reported to Jesus, they were so excited. They said, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, they, they, you can just imagine high fiving Woohoo! Yeah, baby, yeah. And they're all excited. They said, did you, did you see what happened here? Let me tell you the story we, uh, we, we did here. We cast out this demon in this young lady. We cast out this demon in this old, wicked man. Hallelujah. God's power is mighty. God's power is great. And, God, and Jesus, even himself, he says, you know what? I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Boom. Yes, guys, but let's not make that our prime objective. Let's not make that our prime source of our excitement. Be excited that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Let's, let's bring this back here. Can you imagine? It's like, woo oh, okay, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> they just kind of calm back down. They just kind of calm back down. But Jesus wanted them to know. He sent them out, and they did great things in the name of Jesus Christ. These disciples were experienced. No one had as much experience as them in the past ever. Anybody like them whatsoever. And they went around doing everything that God had called them to do. Um, but now they cannot deliver this little boy. They had all that success. They had all that experience. But they could not deliver this boy. Praise the Lord they didn't go and try and make new theology out of it. Well, maybe this. Maybe it's because... Um, I don't know. Maybe it's because I wear corduroy jackets. Corduroy jackets. You know, that may, may make a lot of noise and they interfere with what God wants to do. They may interfere. You know, you, you know how crazy some people can get. They wanted to make an excuse for why they failed, right? So they'll grasp at anything. You know, maybe I need to shave. Maybe, you know, whatever it may be. 
There's all different types of things. Nor did they create, nor did they go to the Bible and say, well, I'm going to look for Bible reasons why God did not heal this boy. Why I could not cast out this demon in this boy. I'm going to look for Bible reasons and give it. True story. Um, I wasn't going to do this, but I thought maybe, why not? Uh, I was youth pastor here. And I love to build the faith in the youth. I love to talk to them about what God has done. I love to open up the Bible and read the powerful, mighty things my God can do and wants to do. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And he loves us, and he wants to deliver us, and he wants to heal us, and he wants to move in a miraculous way. He wants to continue to cast out demons. He wants to raise the dead. He wants to heal. He wants to set people free. And I would share these stories with them about that. I would share them stories about missionaries and how they were relying upon God in a very powerful way and how in doing so God would use them to do mighty things including raising the dead and I said yes that's what I want to see and they would go in different places and they would overthrow a, a, a principality that was there and then healing would come into that village all because they got rid of that demon that was there and I would share these stories with them and I'd tell them all about it and I would talk to them about Smith Wigglesworth you guys ever heard Smith Wigglesworth mighty man of faith and how God used him in miraculous ways one day, one of the student's grandparents, grandmother, died. And um, she was raising them. And she died. And then I get a phone call from a, a friend, a, a, some girl in our youth group. And she says, can you come out here and pray? Can you come out here? We need it. She's dying. Actually, I don't know if she died yet, but she was right there at that spot. So I drove way out in the country. I got there. And by the time I got there, she had already passed away. And there was a nurse there. And there was a hospice nurse who'd been there. And, and everyone was just standing around. And this young lady, she goes, this, this is his grandmother. She raised him. She needs to see him graduate. We need to pray. Terry, those stories you told us. <laughs> Can he do it? Oh, those weeds. <laughs> weeds. So I reached down. And we all gathered around. We laid hands on her. We prayed. We prayed, and she didn't rise from the dead, right? And so, what do I say? What do I do? Anything I could say, I, I, I give her an answer, and I hated to give her the answer, and I hated the answer myself. You know, it did not work in that situation. Why? I don't know. So what do I do? Do I go and look in Scripture, try to find out the reason why, or do I just pass it off saying, well, that's what God wants to do? Obviously, obviously, we're all going to die. Right? If the Lord should tarry, we're all going to die. But there's times um, God does certain things, you know, and, and why or how or when, I don't know the answer to that. But I do know this, he's the one who can. And I go to him continuously. But when it didn't happen, it's like, what do I do? What do I say? And so we kind of get that, and that's when the devil comes in, and he will whisper, said, it's probably because of this in your life. It's probably because you weren't in the Word enough. You know what? You should have been in the Word a lot more than what you are, which is true, right? You, you didn't pray enough. You weren't prayed up. You know what? You haven't fasted. When's the last time you fasted? There's no way you're going to be successful in all these things. And they just, again, the weeds. And the devil will whisper in your pain and in your, in your failures. And he'll, make, he'll just plant those seeds. He's just planting those seeds so that he could choke out the seed of God in us. Amen? That's a trouble thing to say amen to. But yeah, you agree, right? <laughs> okay, all right. They didn't make up any theological explanation. They didn't look for biblical reasons why God did not deliver that child. They were shocked that they couldn't. And so they went to Jesus privately, and they said, Jesus, why couldn't we do that? And Jesus, in verse 29, said this, This kind can be cast out only by prayer and fasting. Now, let's just pause a second. Before Jesus delivered that boy, did Jesus pray? Well, we don't have record of it, do we? Before Jesus cast out that demon in that boy, did Jesus fast? He goes, I'll be back, I gotta go fast, and then I'll come back and we'll pray over this situation. Did he do that? No, he didn't. He went straight to business and took care of business and did it. Jesus didn't fast for the problem whatsoever. He, Jesus didn't fast for the problems. His fasting was a lifestyle of being close to God. That's what it was. Fasting was. So what was the problem? What was the problem? The father thought the problem was the demon in the boy. But Jesus says, no, the problem is this. It's unbelief. Jesus said it. You unbelieving people. The problem is unbelief in our life. 
Yes, there's times that God will not, God does not have a plan or a purpose for this person to rise at that moment. That is true. And that's why we need to have a heart for God and an ear for God and close to God so that we can know that and hear that in our own lives. And God will speak that to us. But there's other times it's just pure unbelief in our own life. The enemy is not intimidated by your fasting. Can I tell you that? He's not intimidated. <gasps> oh, look at him, they're not eating. Ha, 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 ha. You know, he doesn't care. You know, to, you, to him, you guys are just weak. But he knows this, that in, through prayer and fasting, that's when we find our relationship with God. And not only that, that's where we also find our authority with God as well. I'll get into that a little bit later. But when we pray and fast, where we discover two things. Who God is. Who God, God, who you are. You are good. I read all the scriptures about you and you are good. And I, and I sit here and I pray to you. And as I worship you, Lord God, you just fill me with your presence. You are good. Hallelujah. And as I fast, I'm focusing on you. I'm not focusing on the things around me. I'm focusing on you. And so when we fast and pray, we realize who God is and we also realize who we are in God. We are the authority of Jesus Christ in our lives. We are that. We have the authority of God that he's given us. And many times our fast is, so many times when we fast as Christians, it's more like a hunger strike. I'm going to stop eating until you answer my prayer, God. How many of you guys have ever done a fast like that? <laughs> I didn't answer the prayer, so I'm just going to go and starve myself until God answers me, Amen. <laughs> You know, there are times that God does cause us to fast and sometimes we have to fast for things. I've heard lots of stories like that, but many times we use it as a, a manipulation tool for God. And it's like, pfft. and again, the enemy is not intimidated by our fasting. He's intimidated by our authority. He's intimidated by your authority, which God has given you through Jesus Christ. And we just need to know that. We need to allow that seed to grow inside of us and get rid of all the other weeds that wants to choke that out. So I'm going to quickly keep going here. Jesus fasting was a lifestyle fasting. We're learning to have an appetite. What we need to do when we fast is this. I'm just going to quickly talk a little bit about fasting real quick. We need to learn to, uh, fasting is learning to have an appetite for the things that you cannot see. I want what God wants to do in my life. I can't see it. I don't have it in front of me. I, Lord, you call me to be close to you and I want to see your power work in and through me. I want to be able to go and pray for people and see them delivered. I want to take, cast these demons out of people's lives, Lord God, for the glory of God. For the glory of God. So they could be delivered and set free. No one wants to see someone. Can you imagine seeing that little boy the way he was? Man, you want to see him set free, don't you? Had nothing to do with you. You want to see him delivered and set free. And it's the same way God wants us to have that heart for people as well. So when we fast, we're learning to have an appetite for the things that we cannot see. Paul says um, the things that we can see, they're temporal. But the things we cannot see, they're eternal. So we go after God that way. If my confidence is in my money... Uh, my confidence will crash. If my confidence is in my strength, it will crash. If my confidence is in my own wisdom, it will crash, 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 crash. If my confidence is in my skills or my talents, it will crash. But if our confidence is in God and who he is in our relationship with him, then all of a sudden that authority rises up within us and we will be victorious over the enemy in those situations. Amen? Hallelujah. So fasting, it is powerful. But the thing is this, it's preparing our hearts for God. Prayer Prayer, miracles, they come from the unseen world into the invisible world. When we pray, we're praying to God, one who uh, has all the answers. And he says, everything is yes and amen. All my promises, they're yes. Now I need you to be the amen through your prayers. So when we pray to God, we're bringing heaven down to earth. Matter of fact, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. When you pray, you pray this way. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What he wants us to do is to believe that in such a way that we go into a situation and we say, God's kingdom come into this situation. God's will be done in the situation. We make that declaration with our mouth and we declare it in that situation. Listen, God wants us. He wanted his disciples and he got frustrated with him. Oh, you unbelieving generation. How long do I got to be with you? That's kind of how it was. I don't want that said anymore about me. I want to go after God. And if I don't have an answer... I'm not going to go make up something in some new theology. I'm not going to make up something in the Bible that says, well, it's because of this. I want to go to God and say, God, why couldn't that, why didn't that happen? Why didn't that happen? Jesus didn't rebuke them. He just told them right off. You need fasting, you prayer. But you need it not only for this situation, for this demon, but listen to this. Fasting and prayer is one of those things that use to weed out the unbelief in our life. Fasting and prayer weeds out those things that wants to choke out the word of God, the seed of God in our life. 
And when we draw near to God, it's our responsibility to learn the heart and the mind of God and then proclaim it into a given situation. I think that's up there. We're taught to pray, the will of God come. So that's what we need to say, be done in Jesus' name. We're taught to pray that the kingdom of God come. So that's what we pray, God. In this situation, I pray your kingdom come. Lord God, I, I love you and I know that you love them and we just declare your righteousness over their life. And we, we, we declare it. We don't have to beg. Say, I'm not a beggar. Not a beggar. You're not a beggar in the kingdom of God. You are sons and daughters in the kingdom of God. So we declare those things that God wants in their life. And we declare it. You're addicted to drugs. I declare right now that you're going to be set free by this in Jesus' name. I'm going to help you and I'm going to pray with you continuously. But I'm telling you right now, you are set free in Jesus' name. The kingdom of God come in your life. And the kingdom of God is life and wholeness. And it's not addiction to this world and it's not a, a, a slave to the enemy anymore in your life. Amen? You may be addicted to certain things. You may be addicted to pornography. You may be addicted to those things that just stills your authority. It stills those, the power. And you just got to come against that and say, no, not anymore in Jesus' name. Not anymore. I, God's will be done. God's kingdom come. God's will be done in this situation and in my life. We need to know who we are. And the way we know who we are is by getting rid of those weeds. Because those weeds wants to distract us. Look at me, look at me, look at me. You know, that's what it wants to do. And what happens when you look at him? You're no longer looking at God. And you're no longer, no longer looking into the spiritual realm saying, Lord, this is the promises that you have for me. And I claim them right now in Jesus' name. Amen. So we need to be, do that through prayer and we need to do that through fasting. And prayer and fasting is not only the situation of the enemy, but it's also the weeding in our hearts through prayer and fasting. Amen. Jimmy, if you would please come. This kind comes out through prayer and fasting. Jesus is saying the way to deal with unbelief, the way to deal with unbelief in your heart and uproot it is put your attention on the things that are eternal. The way to deal with the, the unbelief in your life is through prayer and fasting. And it does the very thing. Praying. Sometimes it's praying. How do we pray? Well, sometimes you pray in your spiritual language. God has given you a spiritual language. You say, I don't know what to pray. May I let the Holy Spirit pray in and through you. He is the best prayer partner you can ever have. And he wants to be. And so God has given every believer who trusts him and believes him, he's given you a spiritual language. So you just pray in, in your tongues. Pray to yourself. I'm not talking about in public or anything. I'm talking about when you're in your closet, when you're in your home on your knees, you just pray in tongues and you're walking around you just declare the goodness of God and you get lost in the worship of Him and you allow the Holy Spirit to help you and you pray in tongues. Paul prayed in tongues all the time. He said, I wish that you all would pray more. It's a powerful thing and we could talk about that later. Pray in your spiritual language. Sometimes groaning. The Bible talks about, I don't know what to do in a situation, but I know, God, that you're moving. And so you just do this groaning, and you're crying out to God, and you're just speaking the name of Jesus, 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 and allow that groaning. The Bible says that helps. That's part of the prayer life of a prayer warrior. Sometimes it's praying straight from the Bible. Open up the Bible and just read it out loud and just say, yes, Lord, that is for me. Yes, Lord, that is for this situation. Hallelujah, Lord, God. Thank you. And as you pray those things, what's happening? Those weeds are going, boop. They just keep getting plucked out of your life. And listen, when you sin, immediately repent. Say immediately. immediately. Don't put it off. Don't think, ah, oh, I messed up. Ah, oh, I shouldn't have done that. That's terrible. That's terrible. Don't, don't, don't say, I shouldn't have done that. That's terrible. You immediately say, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me for that. Remove that. Don't let it take root in my life. Because the moment you allow it to take root in your life, it will change your personality. It will change who you are and it change the way you think immediately deal with sin in your life and pluck it out. Amen? Give it to God. Give it to God right away. Um, and then when you pray, see, I'm not going to uh, leave this moment. Sometimes prayer lasts a long time. Sometimes we as Christians <clears throat> in a church, we have a time schedule. Uh, we're at home. Uh, you know, I the Simpsons reruns is on again. I, I got to catch that. <laughs> or, you know, I, I've got these things to do. I, I'm, you know, I, I just don't feel like it. I'll do it after I watch my TV, after I'm on my phone, after I do, then I'll, I'll go to prayer. Sometimes when we pray, God's going to have you pray for a long time. So, you're in the presence of God. The God of the universe. The one who loves you. The one who made a way that you could be saved. 
Hallelujah. Sometimes those prayers, you, 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 gotta, you can't just, you got to live in that moment. You got to pray in that moment. You got to pray it through and pray it through. And sometimes uh, you want to be shaped by God. Allow God to shape you through your prayers. Hallelujah. Imagine this story today, if it was happening today, the story of this young boy. He came, someone came to you and said, Joe, can you pray for my son? He has a demon that causes him to do this stuff. Will you please pray for him? Imagine that was to happen right now. How would you respond to that? Will we make up excuses if something happened? Well, God's trying to teach us to be humble. Well, uh, God is working and he's wanting to build our faith. So he's going to allow this thing to happen. Do we make excuses for things not happening? Or do we go to God right away and say, God, what am I doing wrong? What is missing here? Lord God, help me in this situation. Help me with my unbelief. Help me with my unbelief. Amen? Hallelujah. Um, I'm going to close with this little thing right here. There are times Jesus will say to us, the problem is not the demon, Terry. The problem is the unbelief in your heart, and I want to deal with that right now. Will you pray to me? Will you fast right now in the situation? I want you to learn to pray beyond the convenience. You know, just like, Lord, bless me. Lord, help me to be better. Amen. No, I want you to go in after me. This one's got deep roots in you. I want to deal with it right away. Be willing to skip a meal. Be willing to skip a meal. Amen. Focus on the things that last for eternity. And then anchor into what you cannot see. Say, Lord, I believe what your word says. And I can't see it right now, but that doesn't mean a thing. You are the God. And as I pray, you're coming through in that situation. You're bringing deliverance in the situation. And that's where our, our authority comes from. It's through God. So God's word can be accomplished, can accomplish anything. It is powerful. It is mountain moving. It is life giving. And it can do all things in that seed that's inside of every single one of us. And so God wants us to tap into that. He wants us to do the weeding so that that seed can grow in our lives. Amen. You guys want that? Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. We hope you've enjoyed today's message. If you have made a decision to accept Christ as your Savior or in need of prayer, we would like to hear from you. Please contact us at either 574-223-7631 or email us at admin at faithoutreach.cc. For further information on our church, go to our website at www.faithoutreach.cc or like us on Facebook. Either way, you will find information on upcoming events, archived sermons, who we are, as well as other activities going on here at Faith Outreach Center. On behalf of Faith Outreach Center, this is Roger Vogel saying, God bless and thanks for listening. Thank you.